I remember when I was a deacon, Christ Church Charlotte, the bishop had come to visit. And it was one of those days when there was a couple of options in regards to the readings. Well, I processed, I stood up, started to read the gospel, the one that had been marked, only to realize that it was not the one that he had preached on earlier in the morning. And I thought, I don't know how to do this. And I was a bit concerned, a bit concerned about how I was to move forward with this. So I read that gospel, and then I turned and I read the other one as well. <laughs> Have you ever spoken too quickly and wished that you could take it back? Sometimes our words can come out before we've had time to think and we long for the ability to hit pause or rewind and say things just a bit differently. Jesus once spoke to a crowd telling them that it's not what goes into our mouths that makes us impure but what comes out. This can be difficult to grasp. Even the disciples wondered about it they asked Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees took offense at what they heard you just say? Today's gospel draws us up short, and we, like the Pharisees, wonder what to do with all of this. In baseball's AAA minor league, a new rule has been introduced that allows players to challenge umpires' calls up to three times during selected games. This keeps the game cleaner and holds umpires accountable. The idea of do-overs is reinforced by this rule, which reminds us that nothing is permanent or irrevocable. We value second chances in our culture and believe in giving people opportunities for redemption. We love do-overs. We love options. We love choices. We really like second chances. Our culture values these options and chances. We can hit the undo button on our computer if we make a mistake or start over at a buffet if we don't like our first selection. I used to love to go on cruises well, that was before all of the stuff that happened on cruises, but because you could sit down and you could have the meal and then if you didn't like it, they'd bring you another one and you could sit there and eat and eat. I loved it, it was great, it was a great option. Return policies for televisions and automobiles allow us a fresh start within 30 days. As a forgiving society, we appreciate the ability to have second chances and do-overs. Even more prominent events in our life seem to be reversible as well. Marriages seemingly end in divorce more than they often survive. And if you're Elon Musk and don't like the newly acquired business name after all of these years, you can just simply legally change it to a letter X. Certain things were previously irreversible, but can now be changed for the improvement of the global system. I will forever be thankful that what I say over a text message can now be deleted or maybe even just edited. And I guess I'm probably not alone. In an interactive world, we can review our choices and change our choices after we've already made our choices. Little is permanent. Little is irrevocable. Irrevocable, what a strong word so final, so it comes out of our mouth with a thud, irrevocable, done, final, that's it. 
So what are the genuinely irrevocable things in life? A bullet cannot go back into a gun. We cannot take back an unkind word spoken. Too much toothpaste won't go back in the tube. A lotto ticket won't unscratch. And according to Johnny Cash, naming your boy Sue has irrevocable consequences. But in the more significant issues of life, hardly anything seems permanent. Not much is permanent. But God, God is a God of certain irrevocables. Paul's epistle addresses two significant topics. First, he states that anyone who follows God is considered one of God's people. Second, as the Bible stories move on and timelines progress, God's mercy is extended to more and more individuals. And Paul highlights that salvation and has been granted to the Gentiles and firmly denies that God abandons his people. Welcome to Romans. When Jesus, as God in human form, enters the picture, our connection with divinity becomes more profound and permanent. The mistakes that plagued the early relationships between God and his people, that is, the people of Israel, well, they were changed forever. And for Paul, this realization has become a profound impact, a part of him. It rocked his world and led to a complete transformation. In the time following his Damascus Road experience, Paul came to the realization that God is impartial and bestows favor upon all people. This inclusive plan was the very thing that Paul, formerly known as Saul, had been persecuting. You know that Saul who stood on the side holding the cloaks as Stephen was stoned and martyred? That very Paul, once Saul, who was going after everybody who didn't listen to what he said and didn't believe as he believed. But God, in the person of Jesus, reached out to him on that road and said, why are you persecuting me? Don't you know that my relationship with my people is so much bigger than you? You can almost hear it. Jesus standing before him and saying, how dare you? How dare you not love my people as I love my people? God's irrevocable gift offered to everyone is one of his great attributes, not just a single action, not something he does one time and time only. It's not the thing that happens at our baptism and is forgotten. No, the promise is irrevocable. It stays with us from the moment of our baptism, from the moment we even say, you are my God, to the very moment that we take our last breath. You know, that, that word breath in Hebrew is God. The very last thing that we do as a people of God, that very last breath that we take is to call out to God to be in relationship. God knows that and holds that dear. God's irrevocable gift offered to everyone is where God leans in on mercy. Despite our disobedience, despite humanity's failures, despite fall of humanity, 
despite Paul's inconsistency, God still leans in on mercy. And it's there that Paul reminds us of this so that we may understand that God's mercy extends to everyone. That's the core of this letter. That's the core of where we stand. But you know, I didn't really fully understand this until I became a parent. Because as a parent, I finally grasped the concept of showing mercy following an act of defiance. I'll let that sit there for a minute. Because it's in that showing of mercy that it involves a heart filled with love that values relationships over punishment and prioritizes the future over the past. And if we, as parents, can understand that, how much more do we know God appreciates that? The term irrevocable is only found in verse 29 of the scripture and describes something that we need to consider. Paul uses this word to point to something that is without regret. God enters into relationship with us without regret. Irrevocable. And it cannot be undone. We might even consider this to be grace. So although this part of Paul's letter may be challenging to comprehend, it teaches us an important lesson. God remains committed to his promises even when things don't go according to plan, even when we may seem to stray away. God still walks the walk along with you and I. This is the good news. Good news for the whole of the world. Our circumstances may not always go as planned, but it does not mean that God is abandoning the commitments and the promises made to you and me. God is God. And God is always there with us.